Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we are going to be finishing up our little series here with objections to the modal epistemic argument for the existence of God. If you haven't checked out the original video on the modal epistemic argument, you should check that out. Now, in this video we're going to be covering six objections, so I like the number six, to this argument. Let's take a look. So, once again, this argument was offered on YouTube by a YouTuber called the Dutch Philosopher, and the original argument is attributed to Emmanuel Bruton. The argument goes as follows. For all propositions P, if P is necessarily unknowable, not known in any possible world, then P is necessarily false, not true in any possible world. The proposition God does not exist is necessarily unknowable, not known in any possible world, therefore God does not exist is necessarily false, false in all possible worlds worlds. We're going to here be looking at the first two premises and how we can object to them. The conclusion, of course, is therefore God exists necessarily. So the first premise, our objection is going to be there are many worlds, or there may be many worlds, that don't have knowers. So imagine all the possible worlds that do not contain things that are capable of knowledge. Similarly, there's a possible world that's empty, kind of like the empty set, that doesn't have anything. It doesn't contain any knowers. Maybe there's some possible worlds that only have hydrogen and nothing that can know or have beliefs in any way. It seems that there could be many possible worlds that don't contain knowers. There seem to exist truths about those possible worlds that can only be known by first-hand experience. They could be in some way drastically different, and we would have no way of knowing. And in fact, no one would have any way of knowing, because there don't exist any knowers in those worlds. To assume that there are no worlds without knowers is to presuppose the conclusion that some necessary being, some being that exists in all worlds, exists, and beg the question. Our second objection is the statement an all-powerful evil deceiver does not exist, also seems to be necessarily unknowable. And it seems to follow from this principle, this first premise, that a lot of things would be necessarily false that we wouldn't consider necessarily false. The problem is that if both of those statements are necessarily unknowable, then there's no way for us to distinguish between things like an evil deceiver, Ed, and God. And the problem, of course, is that those as necessary beings leads to a contradiction. So we have a problem with our original statement. We have a problem with our original principle, if that principle alone has led us to a contradiction. Speaking of leading us to contradictions, objection three, some true statements cannot be known. In this objection, it's going to take a little longer than the others, it's going to get a little logic-y, I apologize, but it should show conclusively that not only is this principle false, but it is necessarily false according to the laws of logic, if you believe in such things. So, once again, our principle is for all propositions P, if P is necessarily unknowable, then P is necessarily false. We're going to represent this logically with the following statement. If you don't know what that means, you should watch my series on the 100 days of logic. But I'll explain it anyway. For all P, it's necessary that for all subjects S, it's not the case that S knows that P implies that it's necessary that not P. Now, take the statement, no one knows this statement. It has to be true, and no one can know it. If someone were to know it, then it would in fact be false, and therefore not knowledge. Because if someone knew it, then it wouldn't be the case that no one knows this statement. If it was false, it couldn't be knowledge, because knowledge must be true. So it couldn't actually be the case that they knew it. But if in fact no one knows it, then it is true, but unknown. Those were the two criteria we needed to prove incorrect our original principle. But if that's not convincing for you, let's take a look at this logically. So, 
The statement, no one knows this statement is going to be represented by n, and n is just equivalent to, for all s, it's not the case that s knows n. Pretty simple. Knowledge is just going to be ksx, that's just s knows that x. It's going to be defined as justified true belief. You really don't need the justified or the belief part for this argument, so if you have other opinions about what knowledge is, don't worry about it. We'll represent that with, for all s and all x, s knows that x is identical to s believes that x, and s is justified in believing that x, and x, just as the case, bsx is s believes that x, and jsx, just s is justified in believing that x. Okay? That out of the way, let's get to the proof. So, n is identical to for all s. It's not the case that s knows that n. That's our definition of n. And we're going to try to get to n is the case, and for all s, it's not the case that s knows that n. Something is true and yet not known. The thing that would disprove our principle. So, it's not the case that n. That's going to be assumed in direct proof, and we'll draw our line going down. It's not the case that for all s, it's not the case that s knows that n. That's 1, 2, identity. It's not the case that it's not the case there exists some s such that s knows that n. Premise 3, change of quantifier. There exists some x such that s knows that n. That's just 4 double negation. Then we'll instantiate to a. There's a non-specific individual a that knows that n. Existential instantiation, 5. Then we'll use identity and universal instantiation on our knowledge definition in premise 6 to get a believes that n, and a is justified in believing that n, and n is the case. We'll simplify that down to just n is the case, but that's a problem because n and not n from 2, 8 conjunction. That's a contradiction, so we can step out of our indirect proof and conclude that n from 2, 9 indirect proof. Using identity, we can get for all s, it's not the case that s knows that n. We can join those to get our conclusion that we were looking for. If you didn't follow along with the symbols perfectly, I'm going to do it in words for you as well. The sentence n is identical to, for all s, is not the case that s knows that n, our definition of n. And we're trying to get to, it's the case that n, and for all s, is not the case that s knows that n. First off, we're going to assume n is false for an indirect proof. It is not the case that for all s, it is not the case that s knows that n. All we've done here is replace that n with the thing that we said it was identical to in premise 1. It's not the case that it is not the case that there exists some subject s that knows that n. That's just changing the quantifier from for all to there exists and moving the negation sign. We'll double negate premise 4 to get there is some subject s that knows n. We'll use existential instantiation to get from there exists some subject to a nonspecific subject A knows that N. Therefore, that nonspecific subject A believes N, is justified in believing N, and N is true, definition of knowledge. It's the case that N from N is true, that's just simplifying premise 7. It is and is not the case that N to a conjunction, therefore it is is the case that n from 2, 9, indirect proof, because in premise 9 we reached a contradiction. Therefore, for all s, it is not the case that s knows that n. That's just, once again, 10 identity. Once again, we're replacing n with the thing that we said n is identical to by definition. And so we get our conclusion, which is a negation of our original principle. Or is it? When you think back to the original principle, it had some modal quantifiers in it. Now, we're going to take a step farther and show how you can actually prove that it's not only false, but necessarily false. So, our last two premises from our lovely argument above, n and for all s, it's not the case that s knows that n. We concluded these two premises using only the rules of logic in our definitions. So we are allowed to use the necessitation rule on them to get it's necessary that n, and it's necessary that for all s, it's not the case that s knows that n. It's the necessitation rule. Then we're going to do a short little assumed indirect proof here. We will assume that that principle we were talking about is actually true. We'll go ahead and universally instantiate it down to the s 
and n we were talking about. And then go ahead and just use modus ponens on this to get it's necessary that not n. However, we already have it's necessary that n, so we end up with a contradiction. So, stepping us out of this indirect proof, we get it's not the case that for all p, it's necessary that for all s, it's not the case that s knows that p implies that it's necessary that it's not the case that p. The cool thing is, because we've proven all of this within the rules of logic, not only can we conclude that this is false, we can conclude that it's necessarily false. With our necessitation rule once again. So, the proposition, God does not exist, is necessarily unknowable. It's not known in any possible world. Objection number four. A contingent God might know that God does not exist in the actual world. A god that existed in some possible world might know that god does not exist in the actual world. Basically, if there was an omniscient being that existed in only some possible world, that being would know all the truths. And if it was the case that god did not exist here in the actual world, that being would know it. They would know that god doesn't exist. Omniscience doesn't entail necessity. So, they could be an omniscient being in another possible world that was only existing in that world, or existing in a set of possible worlds that did not include the actual world. Therefore, it's possible for it to not be known, or rather for it to be known that it's not the case that God exists. Objection number five, the proposition God does not exist is necessarily unknowable, seems to be necessarily unknowable, or at the very least, it's not terribly well justified. It seems that it's a pretty tough claim to justify. You have to know about basically all of the possible worlds to prove it, as is the same with premise one. Unless you can show it's logically impossible to know, the claim seems insufficiently justified. And finally, there seems to be an equivocation between two different uses of necessarily unknowable. This may not be apparent just looking at the argument, but if you look at Rutten's defense of it, it becomes quite clear. So, in the first statement, necessarily unknowable takes into account and allows for contingent omniscient beings, beings that can exist in one possible world and know everything there. Because he claims to support it, well, what if there was one omniscient being that only existed in one possible world and knew all the truths? That contingently omniscient being would show that all the truths are necessarily known. However, in the second statement, the argument does not take into account contingent omniscient beings, as I mentioned in Objection 4, that might know about God's existence. It seems to wash those over because those would show that they could know, for example, that God does not exist in the actual world. Therefore, not only does the second premise commit the fallacy of equivocation, the first premise, as has been shown, is necessarily false. Up next, hopefully, if we can get the video made, is the depravity argument against God's necessity. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.